Hey, welcome to the Cherry Hills podcast. During this Advent season, we're in a teaching series called Glory, where we're discovering that the glory of God, present at creation, is made visible at the incarnation. Thanks for listening. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you might remember this picture I used as an illustration. Uh, This is the world's most expensive bike made by Lamborghini, over $30,000. And I use that as an illustration two weeks ago. I'm going to use it again today. And here's what I want to say. Can you imagine if somebody actually gave that bike to me for Christmas? But when they gave it to me, I was so afraid to use it that I never took it on a ride. I just kept it inside of my house. What would you say about that? Well, you don't understand the purpose or the reason the giver gave you that gift. They wanted you to use it and to enjoy it. On the other hand, can you imagine if somebody gave that to me and the first thing I did was trashed it? I just went out on a ride. I was careless. I scratched it. I bumped it. You would probably say to me something like, whoa, you do not understand the value of the gift that you had just been given. You're not treating that gift the way that it deserves to be treated. Now, I just want us to keep that in mind, those two things in mind, as we move forward this morning. I'm going to come back to that. But today we are finishing our four-week series in Advent that we've been looking at the first 18 verses of John together, some of the most important passages of Scripture, verses in Scripture in the whole Bible. And we've called this series Glory. And we've been discovering together that the glory of God that was present at creation became present with us, made visible to us at the incarnation. And so far, John has done an amazing job, and we've been looking at three aspects of Jesus' glory. The glory of Jesus as the word. The glory of Jesus as the light. And then last week, if you were here, Luke did a great job talking about the manifest glory who came to dwell among us. Now, Today, as we move towards the last part of these verses, we're going to move away from looking at the glory of Jesus to John asking us this question. If you're following on your notes, why exactly did Jesus come to dwell among us? He has lifted up the glory of Jesus, and now we are looking at why did he actually come? And to answer that, I'd like to invite you to take your Bible, if you brought it with you, to John chapter 1, starting in verse 15. If you didn't bring a Bible, there are Bibles in the seat underneath you there. You can find one of those black Bibles, and you can find this scripture on page 860. And we say this every week, and we mean it. If you do not own a copy of God's Word, we would love for you today to be able to take that home as our gift to you. We would love for you to have your own Bible. So please take that. Now, before we look at verse 15, which is where our text begins, we kind of need a refresher of verse 14 because we can't understand this without it. And so here's what verse 14 says that Luke talked about last week. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Now, last week, Luke talked about the first part of that verse, right? The glory of Jesus coming to dwell among us. And today, I want to talk to you about that second part, that he came to dwell among us full of grace and truth. Now, we already get the answer to the question I was asking in the very beginning here. John answers it for us. If you're following on your notes, why did Jesus come? Jesus came to bring a new covenant of grace and truth. So let's unpack that starting in verse 15, which is our text. It says, John testified concerning him. Now pause here, because this is going to get confusing. Right now we have three Jens or Jennies on our staff. It gets confusing, right? Here, John the Apostle is now talking about John the Baptist, okay? So we're talking about John the Baptist. He's the one who cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, this is some fascinating language. Some of you Bible students know that actually John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. So what is he saying here that Jesus is actually before him? Not only before him, but he's before the creation of the entire world. He understands 
That yes, Jesus was fully human to dwell with us, but he is also fully God, with God in the beginning. If you're on your notes, John understands that Jesus is before the origin of creation. Not just before him, but before all created things. But it's interesting that in the Greek language here, there's another meaning that John wants to get across here. Not only is he before him, before time, before the origin of the world, but he's also greater than him. In fact, he is the greatest of all time. If you're following again, he also knows that Jesus is not just greater, but the greatest. Not only is he before him, but he's greater than him and greater than anyone or anything. That has ever existed. Now, this is high praise from John the Baptist, because Jesus said about John, you might remember, no man born of woman is greater than John. And yet here is John saying, oh no, there is one greater who was born of woman, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas. Now, what makes Jesus the greatest? We've referenced this verse throughout this morning already. Look at verse 16. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Now, now, what does that mean? How do we receive grace upon grace? Well, we can't answer that fully without looking at verse 17. But before we get there, sadly, I think this is how many people view the Bible. Here's how they break it down. We've got the Old Testament. You can also translate that as covenant. So we've got the Old Covenant, and that's all about the law. And then we have the New Covenant. New Testament is the same word there. And that's all about grace, right? That's sometimes how people think of the Bible. But both John and Jesus would fully disagree with that. They would say even the old covenant, the covenant of the law, was a grace, an amazing grace. But there is no doubt that the arrival of Jesus brings an even greater grace than that grace. We have received grace upon grace. And so if you're following, please know, though the law is a grace, Jesus brings an even greater grace. Grace is a thread in the whole Bible. But the progression of grace moves from a God who has given grace through the law to a God who now comes in person to deliver us into a new covenant. I want you to imagine it like this. Imagine you played on a major league baseball team. Eric, can you imagine that right now? Good. And you just won the World Series. And you got a call in your locker room right after winning from the President of the United States congratulating you. You would say that was grace or favor. It's the same idea. He just showed you favor. Now imagine an even greater grace would be that he then invited you to the White House. I want us to remember in the Bible, it's not this split thing. It's all one story, grace in the Old Testament, but an even greater grace given to us in Jesus. And now we come to the heart of our text this morning, the verse we're really going to focus on together. Would you read verse 17 out loud with me there in your notes? It says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You can probably see now, right? He is comparing these two graces. He's comparing the old covenant with the new covenant. The old covenant that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. We know it mostly as the Ten Commandments probably, right? It was a grace, but now Jesus has come to bring a new covenant, a covenant that is full of grace and truth. Now, we know from the old covenant, it had two clear purposes, and both were grace. First, if you're following, the law created a way to relate with God and others rightly. If you're not familiar with the story of Scripture, at one point, God calls this man named Abraham. And he says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And those, that nation became the nation of Israel. And God redeemed the nation from slavery. And he brings them to the Mount Sinai, where he then gives them the Ten Commandments and other laws as a way for them to know him. And as a way to relate rightly with others. This was an amazing grace. The second thing, though, the law did, accomplished, if you're following, is that it also revealed sin And pointed to our need for a savior. It revealed sin. Can we just stop and pause that right here? You realize without the law, without some sort of moral law, we would have no idea the difference between right and wrong. And what separated us from God. It was a grace. I've mentioned this illustration before, but a few years ago, I watched 2020. 
And they were doing a, a series on how clean are our hotel rooms. Now, you walk into a hotel room today, you would go, oh, this is really clean. It's really well done. But what they did is they turned off all the lights. And then they brought a blue light into the room. And if you don't know what a blue light is, it exposes everything here. So let me just say two words of advice. This is for free. First thing you do when you get to a hotel room is take off the top sheet or the top blanket, whatever they have on that bed. Just take it off with gloves, perhaps. <laughs> and the second thing you do is you wear your shoes the entire time you're in there. There you go. That's for free. That's my gift to you. But listen, in a similar way, the law was given to make men and women aware of their sin. And this is why they had to offer sacrifices for sin over and over again. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 3. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, here was the purpose, through the law we became conscious of our sin. The law was like a blue light. Right, that revealed our need for a savior. And that was the point. This was the grace. Listen, you can never be good enough. There is blue light stuff in your life, no matter how nice you look on the outside. Can you imagine, friends, what it would have been like to live under the old covenant? Day after day, week after week, bringing your sacrifice to the tabernacle or to the temple, you would get a real quick understanding of, oh yeah, I, I am full of sin. And I need a savior. It would make you aware of those things. No matter how well you kept your hotel room, so to speak, your life, there are still some things that would be exposed from you. And the key here is that this old covenant, this law was never meant to save us. It was always meant to be a foreshadow of Jesus who would come in order to fulfill the law. The old covenant is just a foreshadow of what would happen when he became the once and all sacrifice for our sin. And so here's the good news for you. If you know Jesus, no blue light is going to expose anything. You have been made clean and holy and pure. There's nothing left in Christ. Now, sadly, though, as time passed, people lost sight of the law. They lost sight of the two purposes of the law. It became something it was never meant to be. It became this external list of rules that promised if you follow this, you will become holy or you'll become better. You'll become cleaner. The Pharisees in the New Testament were the best example of this, right? And so here's, here's a picture of what I imagine this would look like. There's the old covenant, the law. And listen, if you just follow the law well enough, if you're just a good enough person, if you follow these rules and regulations, you can make your way up to the top of the mountain. Do you know what this is called right here? It's called religion. And it doesn't work. Because no matter how hard you try following those rules and those laws, there's still some blue light stuff in you. You can never reach the top of the mountain. When Jesus tried to talk to the Pharisees about this, right? Jesus wasn't about religion. He tried to talk to the Pharisees about this. They would get angry with him because they were like, you're trying to get, do away with the law. You're like too much grace. That would be one way to put it. You got no truth, too much grace. But I want you to read again on your notes what Jesus replies to them in Matthew 5, 17. Would you read it out loud with me? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It's not two different things in the Bible. It's all one story pointing to one person who came to fulfill the law. That word fulfill, it's a wonderful law word. It means to accomplish, to make full, to meet the requirements of. And how does Jesus do that? Like this. This is what we celebrate at Christmas. Here's the second picture. The incarnation. God in the flesh, coming down the mountain, leaving the glory and throne of heaven in order to fulfill the law. This is what Christmas is about. This is what we're celebrating. He came down to dwell among his people. Not only to dwell among us, but to become our perfect savior. 
in order to usher in a new covenant, not just a covenant of works, of law, but a covenant of grace and truth. And this is what separates, I hope you understand, Christianity from every other religion, every other faith in the world. Every other faith, including, sadly, what some churches might teach still today, says we got to be good boys and girls in order to reach the summit. You got to do some good works. You got to be a good person. The gospel, what we call the good news of Jesus, says you have no chance. But guess what? I'm coming down for you. I'm coming down the mountain of holiness for you to save you. We call that the gospel. And maybe you've never heard it. Maybe you've gone to church your whole life and you're like, oh no, that first picture is what I've been taught. That's not what Christmas is about. Christmas is about God coming from the mountain to dwell with us and to save us. But I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't then just get rid of the law and say, this is all just about grace now. In fact, three verses later in Matthew 5, 20, here's what Jesus says. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's like a bait and switch. You just told me you fulfilled the law, and now you're telling me I have to have this righteousness that surpasses. Listen, he's given us that righteousness. And then he equips us to live out who he has then made us as a new creation. Just picture Mount Everest. What would you need in order to climb Mount Everest? You'd need to be equipped with quite a bit of stuff, right? You couldn't just have a Sherpa show up here in this room right now and go, let's go. We wouldn't make it. You would need warm clothes. You'd need crampons for your boots. Uh, You would need uh, someone to guide you, ropes, and all these kind of things. And friends, just listen to this. Many people think that that mountain story, the incarnation, means Jesus has now come to give me a ticket to heaven and I can do whatever I want now. No, he says, I'm going to save you. I'm going to make you righteous. And then I'm going to give you everything you need to come and follow me. That is his invitation. It isn't come and believe in me and then we're done. It's come, believe in me, and then leave everything behind and follow me. That is what it means, that Jesus is a bringer of a new covenant. A covenant that is full of, yes, grace, amazing grace, but also truth. Truth that equips us to come and follow him. In his grace, Jesus fulfilled the law for you and me. He declares you righteous, spotless. You don't even need a blue light. But in his truth, he says, come follow me. I'm going to lay out some things for you to live by in order to live the best possible life. Here you go. And then our text finishes with verse 18. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the end of this incredible section, John 1, 1 through 18. And John wants to remind us, Jesus is God. He has come in the flesh as the word of life and as the light of life. And he came down that mountain, not just to dwell among us, but to restore our relationship with God. Just an incredible passage. Incredible passage. It's been fun to study. But as we close, I just want us to consider for the next 10 minutes or so what it would look like for you and for me to live lives full of grace and truth this Christmas. I mean, listen, if Jesus came full of grace and truth, my imagination says, well, he wants us to experience a life full of grace and truth as well. Now, I'm not talking about trying to find a balance in your life here. That's exhausting, right? If you're like, okay, I need a little truth right now, or I need a little grace right now, that ultimately leads to having neither. You will neither have grace nor truth if you're constantly trying to work that out in your life. For example, think of the Pharisees. And I think of many Christians today. They are full of truth but they have no grace. And if you're following on your notes there, truth without grace leads to legalism and fear. A legalistic person is someone who is like, I gotta follow the rules, and that is what is gonna give me a right standing before God. And so everything has to be done correctly. 
Every flaw, both in themselves and others, needs to be pointed out and exposed. And the best place to do that is on Facebook and Twitter, right? Usually a legalistic person is pursuing an external goal, trying to look good on the outside. I want to impress others through my holiness, through my purity, or whatever it may be. Again, this is called religion, and it's so much easier. Because all I have to do in religion is compare myself to you. And if I'm higher up on the mountain than you, I'm in a better place than you. And therefore, I can justify the life that I'm living. It's easy to think that, right? It's easy to think, well, I'm better than them. That's what religion does. And sadly, this leads to, if you've experienced this, this is my story growing up. Sadly, this leads to things like fear, which I have on your notes, right? Fear, shame, guilt. I was a good kid growing up. I was a good Christian kid. And I thought, I just had to keep being better and better and better. And it was exhausting. And I was always afraid. What if I died right now and got hit by a car? What about that sin I just committed? Right? You could never reach the mountain. That's what religion does. That's what I experienced. It's tiring. It looks a lot like this. Continue. I have a picture here. Here's what I envision. And you're going to see this in the New Testament too. There are churches that Paul has to write to who are experiencing this sort of legalism. Read Galatians sometime. Right? It's all about this legalism. Jesus plus whatever is what is really going to save you. But friends, the truth that Jesus brings does not bring fear. It brings freedom. Would you read what he says about it in John 8 on your notes with me there? Jesus says, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. Too many people think that truth or obedience to Jesus and his word is slavery. When in reality, he came to say, I'm here to set you free with this truth. His truth leads to freedom, not fear, not shame, not guilt, because we trust him and know, listen, this is the best life. This is the path that he has given to me, and I trust this is the best path of life. John would later say in one of his letters, perfect love casts out fear. In his truth, we have no fear because we know the blue light has got nothing on us. To put it as simply as I can, if we fall into this camp of legalism, you're not truly understanding the gospel of God's grace. You need to hear this today. You're worth more than that $30,000 bike. I'm worth more than that $30,000 bike. He has given us an incredible gift, salvation by grace. When we receive that gift, we can now live without fear. We can live with confidence. That even when I stumble, even when I sin, even when I fall, he says, get back on the bike. I got you. This is why I came. Friends, truth is not meant to be a weapon. It's being used that way today, right? A weapon on yourself. How many of you do that, right? Oh, I did it again. Shame on me. I should have, I should have, I should have. Truth is meant to bring you freedom. And if you're following on your notes, living in Jesus' truth is the freest path imaginable. So that illustration I used in the beginning, I get this bike, but I'm too afraid to use it. You would say, you don't understand what the giver of that gift wanted. And I want to say to you, you don't have to live in fear. Will you still stumble and fall and get scratches on your knees? Of course. But he has set you free to get back on your life. That's what the gift of confession is all about. Lord, I fell again. That's all right, son. I want you to get back up. I want you to keep going. Keep following me. So that's one extreme, right? All truth, no grace. How about the other extreme? Is there ever a, an extreme where there's too much grace and not enough truth? Of course there is. You see this in the New Testament as well. I mean, read the letters to the Corinthians, these people. We can do whatever we want, is this what these people say. Now that I've been set free in Christ, the blue light, 
I'm good to go. I can now live however I want. But if you're following, grace without truth leads to license and destruction. If you think grace becomes an excuse to be able to sin, you don't understand grace, right? This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer refers to as cheap grace. If if we live that way, we're not truly understanding the cost that Jesus paid in order to cleanse us, to make us pure and holy. On top of that, the New Testament is abundantly clear. When we abuse grace, it's just going to lead us down a path we don't want to go a path of destruction, a path of emptiness, a a path of dissatisfaction with the way of life. Paul writes about this in these famous verses in Galatians 5. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Good news. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. (gasps) Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You've been set free not to live according to the flesh, according to the world. You've been set free to come and follow me, and those things are going to keep you from that. So if I could put it like this, this is the other extreme, right? If we live with license, this idea that I can do whatever I want, eventually it's going to lead to destruction, both now and forever. Let me use that bike illustration. Somebody gave me that bike. I take it out on my first ride. I destroy it. I trash it. I don't take care of it. You would go, you don't understand the value of the gift. And in the same way, we've been given the greatest gift imaginable. Why would we want to trash it? And live in such a way where we're destroying the gift that God has given to us. We should be grateful for the grace he's given. And that leads to gratitude, which then leads to love, which then leads to I want to follow the truth that Jesus has set out in his life. After all, as Paul says, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. So let us live out that incredible grace. In truth, if you're following on your notes, living in Jesus' grace is a call to keep pure out of love. This is my burden as a pastor. I will say this for the next however many years God has me as a pastor. A person who understands the gift of the gospel of grace knows that obedience is not a burden. They know, because they know Jesus, that obedience is a gift towards the best path of life possible. Jesus would say these words, if you love me, obey my commands. Now, how do you hear that? Do you immediately get thoughts of fear and guilt and shame? Oh, I'm not doing it. I'm not living up. Or do you hear, if you love me, if you really know me, follow me because this will be a wonderful life. This will be a path towards joy, both now and forever. I'm finishing up my two-year Bible reading plan. I'm in the latter parts of the New Testament right now, and I've actually been reading the New Testament through this lens. How should we view obedience? And here was just the latest example I saw. 2 John, verse 6, he says, This is love. That we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in what? Love. Like, I understand. Obedience and love are the same thing. That's my motivation. I am grateful for the gift I've been given. And I know that because God is love, this is the path to true joy. So this is how living full of grace and truth looks joy. You can believe that or you can't believe that. I can't do anything to convince you of that. But Jesus came to bring a new covenant full of grace and truth with the promise that's where you'll find joy. And so I just want to say to you, some of you are here this morning because God wanted you here. Maybe you you don't come regularly. 
And you might fall on that side of the spectrum of legalism. You've gone to churches before and you're like, I want nothing to do with this because I know I'm not good enough. I can't compare to that guy up on the stage right now. You can. Because we have all fallen short. And I want you to hear this. I believe Jesus is saying to you, let go. Let go of your trying. Let go of your effort. Let go of all those works you think are going to impress me and impress others. And then come and rest in me. Some of you are here today. You've been going to church your whole life. You know the gospel in your head. And yet you know you're going down a different path, thinking, well, I'll be forgiven for this. And Jesus says, my grace is meant to lead you to obedience. Not because I have it out against you. Not because I'm some cosmic cosmic killjoy up in heaven. But because I want the best for you. So will you come? Return to me. Repent, confess, and follow me. And so here's the question for all of us this morning as we prepare for communion. Wherever you are, will I accept Jesus' gift of salvation worth more than that bike and live in his grace and truth, believing it is the only way to true joy? As we prepare for communion, I'm going to give you one minute pray to prepare yourself to be ready for this indescribable gift we get to remember every week if you find yourself on that legalism side you're exhausted and tired open up your hands and say Jesus I come to rest in you if you recognize you are using the grace of God as an excuse in your life it's time to confess to ask him to equip you with what you might need in order to follow him, believing truly that this is the path of life. So let's prepare and let's pray. Lord, we do not want to just hear the word today. We want to be doers of your word. So we come to you in preparation. for my friends in this room who struggle with legalism, trying to impress you, trying to impress others. I pray that they could cast off their burden today. Receive the free gift that you have fulfilled the law. That even a blue light has nothing on the purity of our hearts. For my friends, and I know this is an ongoing life journey battle in this place who struggle with continuing to fall off the bike, continuing to sin. Lord, we ask for forgiveness and we ask for the confidence that following you will bring more joy and more contentment than anything this world can offer. And as we prepare for communion, we take this gift, we remember this gift with a newfound appreciation that you brought a new covenant, the covenant of grace and truth. It's in his name we pray together. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's teaching. If you'd like more info on our church, you can visit our website or find us on Facebook.